welcome to Pro UBC Academy which conducts classes for CSI Net and GR. Today the topic of my talk is chronic inflammation and tuberculosis. Now I will start with the question is inflammation good for us? When you ask this question if the inflammation is acute means it will be beneficial to us in in, in uh, securing the invading, in, in, in fighting against the invading microorganisms and at the same time repairing the tissue injury. On the other side, if this uh, if this uh, uh, the inflammation prolongs, then it is called as chronic inflammation. And anything that becomes chronic, it, can, it will sometimes end with this. For example, if inflammation becomes more severe, it leads to arthritis. In case of arthritis. Now, if inflammation takes place in the skin and that is a chronic one, that will lead to dermatitis. So, this inflammatory response, which is actually beneficial to us when we are, the tissue injury takes place or when the bacteria are inside our blood cell uh, invade our tissues. In that case, the acute inflammation is beneficial to us. Now, if we talk about chronic inflammation, if the inflammation prolongs, the same friend will become a foe. Let us see by taking an example of mycobacterium tuberculosis. To begin with, mycobacterium tuberculosis is not a simple bacteria as we talked in the last lecture about E. coli. Once the tissue injury takes place if we talk about this mycobacterium tuberculosis in same way as a macrophage can take any bacteria inside once this mycobacterium tuberculosis it penetrates our airways and goes inside our lungs there it will be encountered with a macrophage called as alveolar macrophage now what will this alveolar macrophage do? It will do what every macrophage does. That it means it will do phagocytosis. So the macrophage comes in and phagocytosis the mycobacterial tubercle vessel. And if you talk about the mode of transmission of this mycobacterial tuberculosis, it is through small droplet nuclei called as droplet. The size of those droplet nuclei is around 1 to 2 microns. Now what happens is the transmission is through the air. That's why if a person who is infected or who displays the symptoms of tuberculosis, if he sneezes, talks, it will release the small drop in nuclei which will be inhaled and it will go down its respiratory tract. Now this bug is special. This mycobacterium tuberculosis is a special bug. The word micro means, I mean, uh, the myco comes from the word fungi and bacteria means bacteria. So, this mycobacterium is like, it's a fungi like bacteria. It means it will have pathogenicity of fungi on the one side and the pathogenicity of bacteria on the other. So, it, this makes it a special microorganism. Now, what it does is it mainly causes tuberculosis. So, the word tuber comes from the idea that as the potatoes display tubers on the surface, the same happens when the lungs are invaded by the micro, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. It forms something called tubers and that's why it is called as tuberculosis, means the formation of tubers. Now, once the terminology is over, let us see how this mycobacterium tuberculosis, what is in that special that it, it evades or it it can fight very well against our immune system. The first thing is the cell wall of mycobacteria is very unique. Unique in the sense is as every bacteria will have a peptidoglycan layer if it is gram positive or gram negative then there will be a capsule surrounding. But in case of mycobacterium tuberculosis they have some extra layers in their micro in the cell wall and for example they have the pep they have the outer uh, the plasma membrane surrounding the plasma membrane there will be albuminocyte, albuminocyte, and there will be peptidoglycan. And above the peptidoglycan, 
A third layer is there called albinum furanacide galactase. And above that furanacide galactase, there is one more layer of called as mycolic acids. This my, these mycolic acids are very specific for this mycobacterium. And then above that, there is an outer membrane. And then outer membrane is also surrounded by a capsule. So you can imagine how hard the cell of mycobacterium tuberculosis is. That's why many of the drugs that are targeted against mycobacterium, they fail to act on it. So far, we have four drugs for treating this uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, that is tuberculosis. And these drugs are rifampicin, so we can talk about the drugs, that is rifampicin, isonizin, pyrazinamide, pyrazinamide and your ethanbutol. So, what they have done is, only there are four drugs against this drug susceptible TB and they are given in the form of DOTS, D-O-T-S. DOTS means Directly Observed Treatment Shock Course Drug. What happens is, this mycobacterium tuberculosis as compared to other bacteria, you can cure them with a single antibiotic. But what, what was found in tuberculosis that when you start to treat tuberculosis with a single drug, it used to give uh, the resistance, it used, to be, it used to become resistant to that drug. And this happened with case of streptomycin. That was the first antibiotic that was used against mycobacterium tuberculosis. So it developed streptomycin resistance. That's why we have to give drugs in the form of regimen. So the current regimen, the, which is used in the drought strategy, uses rifampicin, isoniazin, pyrazinamide, and etambutol. Now, if a person has to take these drugs for six months in two phases, one is the intensive phase, which lasts for two months, and the person has to take all the four drugs. The second phase is called the continuation phase. In that phase, only the first two drugs, that is the rifampicin and isoniazin, are given to the patient and that lasts for four months. In total, it's six months treatment. Now what happens is, if the treatment is available in the market, why TB kills? If you look at the statistics of the WHO tuberculosis report of 2016, it will tell you that one third of the human global population, that is if the population is 6 billion, one third means 2 billion. So 2 billion people are harboring the mycobacterium tuberculosis inside their body, but they don't display the symptoms. Now what are the symptoms of tuberculosis? One is chronic cough, second is high fever, the third is loss of weight. Now what happens in this case is, these two symptoms are only displayed when a latent TB, which is residing inside, silently inside our lungs, when it tries to replicate and it will show symptoms, in that case we can say that the person has become, is a TB patient. So in that case, first thing you should remember is, when the bug goes in, our immune response will be the first to restrict its replication. Now when you look at this WHO Global Tuberculosis Report, you will see that 2 billion people are harboring the mycobacterium tuberculosis as latent TB and when you see the death toll, around 9 million people get infected every year. Infected means they develop the symptoms. And out of them and all the previous cases, annually, you can imagine, it leads to the death of around 1.5 million people each year around the globe. So it is a very dangerous disease. One of the dangerous infectious diseases that has now surpassed HIV also. HIV used to be the leading infectious disease of the world. Now, TB has taken over it. So what is it that makes TB special? One of the things I already explained that is its unique cell wall. Many of the drugs are not able to pass into the cell wall. Now if you talk about drugs, they will have different targets in the bacteria. Number one is the cell wall. Number two can be replication. Number three, it can be say your protein synthesis. Or number four, it can be your RNA synthesis. So all the four drugs I have uh, explained here is one of the drugs that is rifampicin, rifampicin, it will target RNA polymerase of mycobacteria. 
Number two, isoniazid, depicted by a symbol called INH, it degrades the cell wall of mycobacterium tuberculosis. We have third drug called ethambutol. It also targets the cell wall. And the final and the fourth drug that we give in the dose strategy is pyrazinamide. Pyrazinamide is it what it does is it creates an environment where the bug has to face the reactive oxygen species. That means, for example, superoxide anion and your nitric oxide. So it causes oxidative breast within the mycobacterium tuberculosis. But even the drugs are available, so why people are dying? Number one reason for that is, the first reason why people are dying because of mycobacterium tuberculosis is, they show non-adherence. Non-adherence. Adherence. Non-adherence means, any person who has who is showing the symptoms of tuberculosis, he has to take the drugs for six months. These four drugs: rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and etanidol. But what he does is he feels that he is getting okay, and he will he will leave taking the drugs. That leads that is that leads to something very dramatic, and that's called as drug resistance. And one of the drug resistance that is a common term that is called MBRPB. Multi drug resistant tuberculosis. Multi drug resistant tuberculosis is a form of tuberculosis or the, micro, uh, or the bacterium which shows resistance to the first strong antibiotics that is rifampicin and isoniazid. And now what we see is MDRTB has the highest burden in India. The highest burden of MDRTB is in India. The problem is now with the developing countries also. What happens is earlier TB used to be the disease of the poor people. The people who are not well fed, people who are homeless. But now you can see how the bug is evolving. With the, with the, with the, uh, means with the presence of MDRTB, the bug is becoming resistant to the first line drugs. So it, it, they will not respond. So another person has to be kept on the second line drugs. And that duration lasts for 18 months. You can imagine if a person is infected with MDR-TB and at the same time he's infected with HIV, you can imagine the scenario of that patient. What will happen to him is he will not be able to take so many of drugs and that will lead to his death. The third problem why TB has become a havoc is because of HIV-TB co-infection. People used to think that once the drugs were available, they thought that the tuberculosis is going to go off the planet. But this didn't happen. What dramatic thing change, change happened in tuberculosis research is, in 1982, there was a resurgence of HIV. So people who were harboring the tuberculosis bacterium inside, but they were not showing any disease, what, what they did is when, when the HIV broke down the immune system, they showed the symptoms of microbiome, and they showed the tuberculosis. They showed the tuberculosis active disease, and you can see the, the surgence of tuberculosis increase. Now we are at the critical point where we are facing the MDRTB, then there is also something called as XDRTB, that is extensive drug resistant TB. It doesn't respond even to the second line drugs. It will be first resistant to this rifampicin and isoniazid, and then it will also be resistant to your injectable agent, for example, amikacin. And now we are facing the bugs which are called as TDR, total drug resistance. And you can imagine now how this tuber process is laying havoc on our life. Now let us talk about how the immune system deals with this mycobacterium tuberculosis. Why is it not able to completely destroy this mycobacterium as, as happens in the rest of the bacteria? Number one reason is of the tough cell wall, T-O-U-G-H. 
this cell wall being rich in lipids, it rarely allows any lipophilic tract, I mean so hydrophilic tract to pass through this. Only lipophilic tracts have the ability to pass through the cell wall. Number second problem with mycobacterium tuber process is it evades the immune surveillance. It evades immune surveillance. Immune surveillance. What immune surveillance means is that it will flow under the radar of the immune system, but the immune system will not be able to detect it. Why? Because mycobacterial tuberculosis is an intracellular pathogen. Intracellular pathogen. Being intracellular, once it goes into the lungs, it will start residing in the cells of the lungs, and immune system will not be able to detect it. In some cases, what happens that this bacteria will multiply, it takes it around 24 hours to multiply. That means it's a slow growing bacteria. And this gives him also a better advantage to face the antibiotics. Because when you give him the antibiotics, the concentration decreases with time. But this is not the case with mycobacterium tuberculosis. Once you take a medicine, the medicine will go out of the system, but the bug will still be there. So, because it's an intracellular pathogen, it evades the immune surveillance. Now, if it somehow contacts the macrophages, because they are the first line of defense against any intruding bacteria, if the macrophages take them in by a process called phagocytosis, it does it by making a phagosome. So, mycobacterium will be within the phagosome. Now, in order to digest this mycobacterium, it has to fuse with the lysosome within the macrophage. And this is one more advantage mycobacterium tuberculosis uses. It doesn't allow the phagosome to fuse with the lysosome where it will be digested. So this is its third kind of how it evades your immune system. Now what happens is it will remain in this macrophage and the macrophage is what they do usually with other bacteria is they start developing reactive oxygen species. But in this case even the reactive oxygen species are not able to degrade this or they are not able to defend against this. Now what will happen is this mycobacterium tuberculosis bug it will remain within macrophages for a very long time and what it does is if it's not able to be degraded it's not able to get it doesn't allow itself to get fused with the lysosome what will happen is that it will start multiplying within the macrophage so once it starts multiplying within the macrophage they make many copies of themselves and ultimately it leads to the damage of the macrophage and when macrophages release other bugs other mycobacterial tuberculosis bacilli they can infect other cells now the immune system has some other strategy to face it if it's not able to kill it if it's not able to completely kill it, but it can do one thing. Once it's at a particular place, it can wall it off. The immune cells, what they do is, to deal with mycobacterium tuberculosis, when it goes to the lungs, so immune cells, they start getting infiltration into that place. And many kinds of cells, for example, macrophages, then dendritic cells, then T cells, then B cells, all the kinds of immune cells, they will surround these mycobacteria and they will wall it off from the rest of the body in order to protect the body itself and this walling off when the bacteria is walled off that is called it forms something called as granuloma 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 Granule comes from a Greek word which means small particle and oma means formation, comes from a Latin word. So granuloma means it forms like particle, particle like, particle like structures, granuloma. Now what happens is with time, this granuloma gets calcified, calcified. Once it's calcified, it forms something called as Goon's complex. That's called G H O N S Goon's complex, and this Goon's complex is easily visible in X-rays. 
I mean when you are supposed to diagnose the tuberculosis, the first test is the skin tuberculosis tu tuberculin test that's called as Mantox test. The second thing is x-rays which many patients are suggested to go for if they have some other disorders in order to detect if they have a general respiratory disorder or if they are infected with mycobacteria. These goons complexes are very much visible in the x-ray. What happens next is now the bacteria is there, it's walled off, but sometimes what happens is the granuloma will break down, it will liquefy. It will liquefy. L I Q U I F Y. It will liquefy. So once it liquefies, the bacteria that are inside this the one who are walled off, they are in the phase of anaerobic metabolism because they keep themselves there for a longer time because they have an adaptation. They can change themselves, they can change their metabolism from aerobic to anaerobic. Now once it liquefies, the bacteria can come outside and when the environment is rich in oxygen, they can shift back to their aerobic atmosphere and then they will start dividing. This is called as millary tuberculosis, M-I-L-L-I-A-R-Y TB. Millary TB means you the bacteria starts replicating in the form of small millets and they can go through all the body and this is also called as tuberculosis reactivation now let us see how it causes chronic inflammation because when immune cells are not able to completely get rid of it they will keep they will keep the things like they will keep they will keep on fighting against it and that leads to chronic inflammation that is how it can damage the tissue so in, in other words you can say that the bug itself doesn't but your own immune system which was there to defend you now it's acting against you the one who was your friend he has become your foe so what it does is starts damaging the tissues and this liquefaction will make air spaces within the lungs so ultimately you will see that it is the inflammation which leads to the degradation of lungs so if you have a person who is suffering from TB you will start you know, he will start breathing, you will start breathing high size because what happens is his, his lung is going to get degraded with time. So talked about this, what are we going to supposed to do with this MTB, particularly against MDRTB. Now when you look at the tuberculosis drug discovery, what happens is that there hasn't been any new drug in the market since 1972. The last drug was came was Bifamicin. Now what happened is recently an FDA made a fast approval of a drug and that drug is called Bedaquilene. Bedaquilene. Or you can also call it as DMC207. This drug got fast track approval from FDA against the MDRT. It is currently in the market now and people are being treated with this pedagogy. Now let us see how we can diagnose the tuberculosis. The simple method to diagnose the tuberculosis is Mantox test. Mantox test is nothing but it is a skin test where a derivative of uh, mycobacterium or PDD is injected in, inside the intramuscular place and then within 14 hours if it shows redness then you can say that the person is having the bug inside even if he is not showing the symptoms of tuberculosis number two is x-ray it detects Gould's complex and number three is PCR these are some of the classical things and one more thing is their sputum microscopy. Sputum microscopy. This sputum microscopy is still, still considered as a gold standard for gold standard for diagnosis of tuberculosis. Now if I ask, do we have any vaccine till date against mycobacterium tuberculosis? Do we have it or don't we have it? 
On this vaccine that you might have heard about is BCG. That's called Bacillus category. But this vaccine is only effective in case of children. Any adult who gets infection by if a person suffering from TB, he coughs, sneezes, or talks, this nuclear, uh, this nuclear bacilli will go inside the lungs and they will cause tuberculosis. So, till date, there has not been any progress in case of the vaccines of tuberculosis. There is one more reason why tuberculosis has been developing. You know, it's very hard for even the developing countries to deal with it. So, I will conclude this lecture by saying the word that if you, if in, in your life the things get tough, the tough has to be, become better. I mean, your immune system has to become better. So this is how the immune system, when facing the tough bug like bacteria, it responds by a process called as chronic inflammation, which does more harm to our body than protecting itself. Thank you very much, and subscribe our video and make your comments downstairs. If you have any questions, you can ask us on the ProUBCAcademy.com website. And next time, see you next time. Thank you very much.